Welcome to Sappho Salon. Sappho's is a recurring performance series featuring female, trans, and non-binary artists exploring gender, feminism, and sexuality in their work. Liz Bodler and Eileen Tull, that's me, have been co-hosting the show for five whole years. Usually we hold our show at one of the best places in the world, Chicago's Women and Children First Bookstore, but we, like everyone, are staying home right now. Because we couldn't celebrate our fifth year anniversary in person, we got some of our friends together to celebrate it virtually in your living rooms. So please sit back and enjoy Sappho Salon, the fifth anniversary virtual spectacular celebration extravaganza show. Our next performer is Chloe Janelle. Chloe is a writer and a poet, as well as an actor uh, on Chicago stages and screen um, in TV and film. You may have seen Chloe in Chicago Fire or Empire or Dancing on Stage with the Fly Honeys. Um, Chloe has performed with us primarily as a poet, and we've had Chloe at Sappho's a couple of times, and then we've also worked together um, with the plagiarists uh, in the Plagiarist Salon. Uh, I'm so excited to have Chloe on board for this show. I love their poetry. I love hearing them perform it and watching them perform it. There's something so compelling about their uh, delivery and their their voice um, and their outlook on, on life that gets translated into the poetry. Um, you can find Chloe online and you can support them on Patreon. And without further ado, Chloe Janelle. Friends. Oh. My name is Chloe. As you can see, I am outside because it is a beautiful day and I live in a very loud apartment, but we're going to do this the best that we can. So my name is Chloe and I have a poem for you that's called The Only Tree on the Block That's Blossoming. And I wrote this um, probably a week ago now. Um, and it's about home and what home feels like for me um, during this quarantine stuff. Um, I'm not originally from here, I'm from Arkansas. All of my family is there, so it's been really interesting. And I've been in Chicago for uh, almost five years now, so it's it's been really weird, like, during this time, having this longing to want to be where I was born and raised, but also feeling safe in Chicago um, because I've made it a home. It's been my home for five years now. It's Chicago has seen me grow in ways that Arkansas has not. Um, so that's what this poem is about. And I'm gonna take it to the poem now. Okay. All right. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. We're just gonna get right into it. Here is the only tree on the block that's blossoming. Written by me. I left the house twice today, a new record for me. One time for snacks at the dollar store and a second time for a large Dr. Pepper and medium fry from McDonald's. And both times I felt air that once occupied her lungs massage the bottom of my feet like she knew me personally, like we hadn't gone a year without speaking new appreciation for the place I call home, Chicago, a place where resilience meets magic, where the only tree on the block that's blossoming is the one that reminds everyone that we all belong here. The splashes of green decorating the nakedness that sits outside our window, like grandma waiting for us to come home, and she said it's time for us to come home. Time for us to come home now and finally stay put like nail polish that won't come off my pinky toe no matter how hard I try I scrub and scrub and scrub I think the show is over that she's finally fed up and that for once we must give up and listen to what she has to say whether we want to or not of your day or evening or whatever time of day
that you're watching this. I love you all. Stay safe. You may know Ada Chang from her one-woman shows, her long and successful storytelling career, and her role as the host of not one, not two, but three, three storytelling shows. Talk Stories, Am I Mad Enough, and Pour One Out. Ada is my favorite college professor turned performer, and I love the stark simplicity of her narratives and how directly they engage the uncomfortable. She also, though, can be hilariously funny, as you would know if you've ever heard her share impression. Ada is a gift to my life that I can track directly through Eileen. From the moment that I first heard this small, brightly colored person open her mouth to tell a story, I knew that she would shake all of our notions with just a smile or a stern look. She's been a friend of the show since she first knew about us and has been a fan favorite among our friends at Deborah's Place where we periodically do outreach to women experiencing homelessness and that to me is the biggest testament to her skills at connecting across people and time. I've had many, many fond moments with Ada. We share a tarot card destiny after all. But one of my favorites will stand as the last time I expect to see her in person for the foreseeable future. The unfortunately last time I expect to see her in person for the foreseeable future. Thanks, coronavirus. When we had dim sum in Chinatown in early March. Are you adventurous? She asked me. Yep, I said, fairly confident in my adventurousness. Great, she said cheerfully. Let's order chicken feet and tripe. And it was delicious just like the shared adventure of her work and our friendship. Proud to bring you Ada Chang. P.S. My partner just chimed in with, I like everything about Ada. She's so awesome. So there you go, an additional endorsement. The following is a series of exchanges between a student and I at a university where I am a full-time staff. I work as an education and outreach specialist on issues related to gender-based violence. The message was sent to my unit, even though the issue may not be specific to what I do. Dear university staff, hello. I want to report an insulting incident that happened to us today. My friends and I were at a BSB building trying to grab some coffee from the coffee shop. We were waiting in line, and finally, when it was our turn to order, we stepped forward. However, during that short time, we heard an absurd racist joke that people at the cashier made, saying, Watch out for the coronavirus. As everyone knows, the coronavirus is a global issue that has taken away more than 500 innocent lives. Treating us as that virus is both humiliating and insulting to the people who are suffering and fighting for that contagious disease. It is very unfortunate that this occurred during Black History Month, the month that we all believe everyone should not be discriminated by the color of our skin. I hope you examine this issue. We sincerely want an apology for the inconvenience. Student. Dear student, thank you for the message. I'm very sorry this happened to you. I would like to meet with you in person to discuss the situation. Let me know when you can stop by. Ada. Dear university staff, Thank you for your kindness. We were all furious about the incident. However, after knowing that there are people who actually care about us minorities, it gives us pride knowing that we chose to come to this university. Again, thank you for offering us the options to deal with this matter. But we have decided not to make a scene. Student. Dear student, I don't think you will ever read what I'm going to say here, but I do hope at some point you will tell the story on your own term. I haven't been able to sleep for days since I received your email. That last sentence, we have decided not to make a scene, 
hit me hard. That sentence has filled me with sadness. It feels like someone has been driving a knife into my heart. I'm not going to die from it, but my heart aches and bleeds with each gentle cut and push. Your message was the first complaint I received, but it was not the first one I have heard. Since the outbreak of the coronavirus, we have seen an increase of hatred toward Chinese people, people of Asian descent, or Asian Americans in general. Physical assaults have taken place, racial slurs hurled, suspicious looks cast, masks put on specifically when Asian people are present, otherwise socially conscious people making jokes and references about coronavirus and Chinese people. Businesses in Chinatown plummeted due to misinformation, xenophobia, and racism. They come from all sides. In a world where racism is often seen between black and white, discrimination, prejudice, racism, and xenophobia toward and against Asians are discounted, taken for granted, and normalized. That even UC Berkeley briefly, briefly posted something along the line, xenophobia is a normal response after the outbreak. Our own president insisted on calling the virus Chinese virus, knowing fully well that a pandemic will bring out pre-existing hatred, xenophobic sentiments, and racist assaults against people of Asian descent. Different universities sent emails warning students about coronavirus, yet very few made statements denouncing anti-Asian racism. We don't label any germ, disease, illness, or virus white when they wipe out Native American tribes. Why do we label Corona Asian? This pandemic shows how easily we, as Asian American, can go from being model minority to yellow peril in this country within seconds. I was so sad that I started crying when I met with the university administrator to discuss this issue, hoping to push the university to issue a stronger statement about this concern. I have to admit that it was embarrassing to shed tears in front of a colleague whom I met for the first time, but my sadness overflew and my tears started dropping. But what I want you right here is not about the virus. It is about that last sentence of yours. We have decided not to make a scene. I truly see you because you reminded me of my younger self. When I believed that people would understand where I was coming from and empathized with my position if I were polite enough, respectful enough, articulate enough, or liked enough. And then it dawned on me one day, my degree of politeness, respectfulness, or likability has little to do with whether people can grasp the complexity of issues. For some, they understand them all along. In my culture, I was taught since I was young to be quiet, to not speak up, to not challenge authorities, and to keep peace and maintain harmony. I have worked very hard to develop my own voice and to have one. When I was younger, I tried hard to balance between having a voice and wanting to be liked, having ideas and opinions and being seen to opinionated and loud, and telling people how I really felt and what I really thought and not wanting to alienate with everyone with my truth. I still struggle with that, and I'm in my 50s. The reality is, there's no balance. It is a lose-lose situation for me as a woman. I do have the benefit of racial perception. I'm hardly seen as militant or aggressive, even as an Asian woman, even when I am, compared to a black woman who can easily be seen as aggressive, even when she is simply being assertive. But the worst part is this. When you don't practice speaking up for yourself, you end up losing the only voice you have. Your own. 
I want you to remember this. Silence can be a strength, but it isn't always a virtue. Being quiet doesn't always bring you peace. Being polite doesn't always keep you out of trouble. Being respectful doesn't always get you to respect in return. This story is not completely mine to tell. It is also yours to share. But please, learn to tell your own story as I can't always tell stories for others. Learn to shout on top of your lung. Make a scene. Be the troublemaker. Be the trouble. It's time. It's time. Ada. Thank you. Hey, Strife, what do you think of the show so far? That good, huh? The next performer coming to our stage is our very own co-host, Liz Bodler. And I'm so grateful for Liz, always, but especially in this uncertain time. Um, there's no one else that I would rather be weathering storms with than Liz. And over the last five years of um, co-hosting Sappos, we've had a lot of ups and downs and ins and outs and challenges that have come up. And I'm so grateful to have had Liz by my side for all of those. And we complement each other in a lot of really great ways. And we also compliment each other in a really nice way. I'm sure Liz is wearing a great blazer right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, the one thing that I really would say about Liz is that something that, that they've taught me over the last five years is to be more, I don't know, I guess open-minded and more accepting. Um, something that Liz has described themselves as or um, is that they were always the person who would go sit with the kid at lunch that had nobody to sit with. And I've always thought of myself as that person, but in truth, I'm not always that person. And being cool or belonging or, or being accepted by other people really matters to me. Um, and it takes a lot of strength to um, go against the grain or to reach out to somebody that is an outcast or that is having trouble or somebody that is just not fitting in to whatever standard is, is the standard. And Liz always does a really great job of bringing people into the fold and being, you know, such a consistent, supportive person. Um, and, and I feel like I have tried to emulate them in that respect. So um, please sit back, relax, and enjoy my very talented, very wonderful friend and co-host. Liz Bobler. My one neighbor is banging on the wall right behind me for no good reason. Never heard that before. The, my other neighbor is the infamous bellower who likes to belt out usually women fronted songs uh, on his headphones to all of us at random times of day. Nine in the morning, one at night. You name it, he's done it. He's really fond of because of the night though, so I guess I'll give him a pass. So, I am sitting on my couch in a pair of my fiancé's corduroys that are ripping at the belt loops. Our couch is ripping too. It was a second-hand couch for one of her old roommates that we rented a U-Haul to pick up back in 2012 when we had no couch and were also just roommates. I drove the cargo van. She refused to look out the window at the side mirror because she said she wasn't good at that. Over this past winter, we bought a couch cover for the couch, which will probably be jettisoned to the alley when we move again. Who knows when we're going to move again? The couch cover was lime green, a cheap job from China, and it also ripped. The first time we kissed, and then shortly thereafter had sex, it was on this couch. I've told that story a lot, it seems. I hate videos! I'm not much of a performer. My hair looks terrible. I really couldn't figure out what blazer to wear. I got a job, a, a new job. It doesn't start for a month, which is fine. I can sit around making money, being a victim of the industry, which is a victim of our lack of ability to go out in public anymore. The new job involves talking on the phone. 
I hate talking on the phone. But health insurance! Am I willing to talk on the phone to ensure the possibility that I either won't die or at least won't be murdered by medical debt? I think so. There's no possibility, really, that we won't die. I mean, we, in the future, we will all die, but who knows about the present? No matter how many groceries you spray with alcohol, uh, the alcohol you bought to clean the stove burners last year. I don't want to use our building's shared laundry room, but eventually, about every three weeks, I think about, man, what if... Well, in the middle of me reading the piece, my phone decided that it was completely out of memory and stopped recording, and then my neighbor started singing firework very loudly. Let's move on. Shall we? There's no possibility that we won't die. Eventually. Hopefully not soon. No matter how many groceries you spray with alcohol that you bought to clean the stove burners last year. I don't want to use the shared laundry room, but eventually about every three weeks, I think about dying and I think about being suffocated in a pile of rancid t-shirts. And I don't want to be found like that, so I do the goddamn laundry. The first time I did the laundry, I wouldn't even wear the clothes I wore down to the basement inside. Life got simpler once I accepted that clothes probably wouldn't kill me, but my standards still might. The day we were forced to vote, vote in masks and kitchen gloves, unless your ballot somehow showed up in your mailbox before then, I went to the bank for $30 and quarters and dumped them all in rubbing alcohol for a week. If I'm performing anything, it's just light germophobia. I could patch up my pants. I could break into that box of very serious skincare products on the windowsill that my friend gave me. My bathroom isn't big enough for it, so that's why it's on the windowsill. I could juice all of those kiwis. I forgot I liked kiwis or used to like kiwis when I was a kid, but apparently not enough to eat them enough to justify the elusive produce box that only shows up after you've been waiting in the virtual queue to ask for a refund. I could argue with people about on Facebook about how I'm supposed to be angry or not angry about the things they say. I could argue with my fiancé, except that we don't argue that much anymore. Which I am glad about, because I can't imagine being trapped inside with someone whose presence would consistently make me want to hide under a table, or a blanket, or behind a door with a jammed lock. A lock that got jammed when it was wrenched open by someone who didn't understand the meaning of a closed door. I haven't been to that place for nearly eight years, and I'm not going back. There was one week recently where my fiancé and I argued every day, but the arguments didn't last more than an hour and some far less. I was getting my period. Or getting over my period. Otherwise, we're happy. We say deep things to each other at odd hours of the morning. We take turns making food of various complexities for each other. We take photos of our cats. We talk about how weird the cats are. We listen to true crime podcasts. That is not a pandemic development. I do the dishes and clean because I like doing those things. And then she sits and thinks because that's what she does, whether she likes it or not. I could write poetry, but well, that was the big thing I did the second two weeks of our time inside. Say, after I recovered what from uh, telling people what not to touch for five, nine hours, days a week. It hasn't been what I've wanted to do lately. A few days ago, I took a bike ride around my neighborhood because I could feel when I sat on the rocks by the lake outside, I was angry. And honestly, the bike ride didn't really help because it just reinforced how unimpressed I am where I, with where I live. Despite its beautiful lake border, which when it comes down to it, it's just another thing keeping us here. And it's pretty, I guess, but it's a pretty I need maybe once a month. Anyway, I was biking around and word fragments were bouncing into and out of and around and inside my head about how we were all shelved into little boxes stacked on top of each other. And so many people's blinds are closed, so I can't even learn about their lives 
even though I'm possessed by a vague curiosity I never had before. And now I just sound like that 60s folk song. But it doesn't actually matter if you're a doctor. No, no, it does actually matter if you're a doctor right now. Or a lawyer, or a business executive. If we're all just shoved into little boxes stacked on top of each other so we can let a fine layer of viral dust blow by and accumulate harmlessly on our streets and lawns and suspended lives. The harm, though, the harm's already happening. I'm not depressed, I promise. I just don't have a very significant life, whether before or after this, or very much to say, whether before or after this. I can't actually imagine reading this out loud. It's not as if I ever notice or very much care about the audience when I do perform. There's been times when I have, I think, but ultimately, I don't care very much about my audience. Which is why I am not, never will be, a performer. I took an improv class with Eileen, and the suggestion was train station, and I decided to be the train. But trains don't talk to other people. I keep reading headlines about how video is draining because we need to take the to be able to be present without being present. I need to be here for all of you. Do I really? Here I sit bringing you no inspiration from my couch. I am bringing you no joy or insight. I think it's just much simpler to stay inside and only talk to the people you want to talk to on maybe two out of seven days of the week. No one really wants to know what they look like on camera for hours on end. No one can feel right now the gentle warmth that passes between two people or a crowd and say that suffices for connection. We are all fundamentally alone, no matter who we are with. Am I Greta Garbo? Or Werner Herzog? Is this a party? Shit. This is supposed to be a party. I I'm not much of a performer, and yet people always look to me for smiles and cat pictures and silliness. Even when I was 12 and the lock on my bedroom door was jammed, and I didn't even have any cats. But honestly, I'm not that sad. I just don't feel like performing for you. I am so excited that I get to introduce our next performer, Nair Na. Uh, Nair is a musician, a singer songwriter, a visual artist who uses her superpowers as a chronic overthinker to dive deep into the labyrinthian themes of mental health, addiction and recovery, interpersonal conflict, and self acceptance. And she has re released two full-length albums with the local indie label Preserve Records. And those albums are The Court Age and Everything Stands Back Up. They're both albums. And on Saturday, May 2nd, you can catch Nair playing a short set for Preserve Records uh, in a collective live stream extravaganza. Um, you just search for Preserve Records on Instagram and you'll get more information about their events. And if you want to support Nair, you can go to patreon.com. Um, and look for Nair Na, and you can become a patron um, on Patreon. <laughs> so Nair is just one of my favorite humans, but also one of my favorite artists. Um, I listen to her music a lot, and I I kind of keep it uh, on a playlist for, um, I have like a sort of a addiction and recovery playlist of, of different songs that help calm me, that mean a lot to me, and her songs are included in there, um, as she is a a fellow recovery uh, and addiction warrior as myself. Um, but I love Nair. She's such an, uh, a, an easeful stage presence. Um, I feel like the word relatable is so overused, but it is really like that's her, her persona just feels very um, accessible. And then her voice is so unique and so beautiful, uh, and as is her brain and her heart. So please enjoy some musical selections from our good friend, Nair Na. You and I woke up with the window 
windows painted shut The lighting fit the mood You carry a torch, I hold a grudge And the reason you're confused is certainly to be that I am too All afternoon I watch the house plants bloom Tap time we hit the wall We've got things to do outside this room You pick up slack, I drop the ball You've grown so much I want to give you a haircut Declare a death match edition of who loves, who loves not On second thought, on second So why not call it a drop, call it even a toss-up? Love is blind and deaf and dumb. I love you, but I can't become you. So I run from gun to loaded gun. You past the point of exhaustion. One more big mistake for learning say Relevant for the hell of it. You pat me on the back, I slap you in the face. I'll apologize in a little bit. But who told you to make Bed and then force me to sleep in it. I can't take much more of this crisis of confidence. On second thought, on second thought, on second thought, I had a point to make that I forgot. So why not give it a rest? Deep breaths, call it a toss up. Pause for applause. Woo! <sighs> I wonder if Eileen will edit this out. I don't know. Oh, I am very depressed. Hello. Um, I did a take of this earlier after I did the first song, and I was very sad, and it was inappropriate for the song, I think. It was just, like, too much. Um, so here is this cover <laughs> song. Uh. No 
matter how hard I try, you keep pushing me aside and I can't break through. There's no talking to you. I'm so sad that you're leaving. It takes time to believe it. But after all is said and done, you're gonna be the lonely one. Oh, do you believe in love after love? I can feel something inside me say, I really don't think you're strong. That's it, I think. Uh, thank you, Sappho's. You're the best. Ah, they're coming. Ah, they're coming. Run. I'm going to try for better eye contact this time. It's been five years. A little more than that since we first met in person at the great LGBTQ storytelling show, Outspoken, in February 2015. Five years since I found out that Eileen wasn't a scary butch lesbian. Five years since we first stood on a stage, or bookstore floor, I guess, uh, together. And in those five years, I've realized how curious and passionate and brilliant and funny and overflowing with empathy this person, who I feel like I might not have met otherwise, can be. I truly love sharing the endeavor of this show with her, and the trust and communication we have built up between us is largely unparalleled in my life. She will always be funnier, and more poised, 
and way more straight than me. And it is really all of that that allows Sophos to function as well as it does. Eileen Tall, storyteller, poet, performer, professional goofball, host of the Vulnerability is Killing Me podcast, and my very good friend. Here's to a lifetime of friendship and whatever it is that you're about to say. Hello. I would like to share with you a poem that I wrote during this quarantine time period. It is a little bit of an intense piece, but I think that it really captures this feeling of frustration and the feelings of despair that I have been experiencing and that I'm sure a lot of you have been experiencing. So I hope you like it. Um, <sighs> Somebody once told me the world is going to roll me. I ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. He was looking kind of dumb with his finger and his thumb in the shape of an L on his forehead. Well, the years start coming and they don't stop coming. Fed to the rules and I hit the ground running. It didn't make sense not to live for fun. Your brain gets smart, but your head gets dumb. So much to do, so much to see. So what's wrong with taking the back streets? You'll never know if you don't go. You'll never shine if you don't glow. Hey now, you're an all-star. Get your game on. Go play. Hey now, you're a rock star. Get the show on. Get paid. And all that glitters is gold. Only shooting stars break the mold. It's a cool place, but they say it gets colder. You're bundled up now. Wait till you get older. And the media men beg to differ, judging by the hole in the satellite picture. The ice we skate is getting pretty thin and the water's getting warm, so you might as well swim. My world's on fire. How about yours? That's the way I like it, and I never get bored. Hey now, you're an all-star. Get your game on. Go play. Hey, now you're a rock star. Get the show on. Get paid. And all that glitters is gold. Only shooting stars break the mold. Somebody once asked, could I spare some change for gas? I need to get myself away from this place. I said, yep. What a concept. I could use a little fuel myself and we could all Use a little change. Well, the years start coming and they don't stop coming. Fed to the rules and I, I hit the ground running. It didn't make sense not to live for fun because your brain gets smart and your head gets dumb. So much to do, so much to see. So what's wrong with taking the back streets? You'll never know if you don't go. You'll never shine if you don't glow. Hey now, you're an all-star. Get your game on. Go play. Hey now, you're a rock star. Get this show on. Get paid. And all that glitters is gold. Only shooting stars break the mold. Thank you so much. Stay safe. That's our show, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully we'll see you all again in real life in Women and Children First Bookstore. But for the meantime, everybody stay safe.